Hello, I'm Ozzy Oswald, and welcome to Religion and Life. The Society of Friends, better known as the Quakers, are well known for their beliefs, separation of church and state, and pacifism. How do these views affect Quaker participation in today's political process? To help us understand it all is this week's guest, Dr. Marjan Ames Zimmerman. Welcome, Dr. Zimmerman. Hello. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So, um, uh, a lot of us know the, the name Quakers or, or the Friends, but uh, perhaps uh, their, their belief structure or their history even is not as well known. So, uh, I know that a lot of your research is uh, dedicated to the beginnings of the Quaker movement. So, maybe you could just take us back a little bit and uh, tell us who the Quakers are, where they came from, um, how they developed, and so forth. And sure. then, we, then we can start to piece together how all that fits with their uh, potential political views in today's climate. Sure. The, the Quakers originated in the 1650s in England. They were an outgrowth of the Puritan movement that contributed to the English Civil War, the beheading of Charles I, roundheads, <laughs> all that stuff that you know from history class. And um, they were a sect that emerged as a response to being dissatisfied with the changing religious environment as it was. So they started in the early 1650s, um, there isn't one single leader, but George Fox usually gets mm -hmm. the credit for having started the movement. You know, what, so they, they were actually Puritan to begin with, or was they were George sort of, Fox a Puritan to begin he with? He grew up as in a couple different denominations, but you mm -hmm. could definitely say that he was in sort of the Puritan worldview. So he um, was for a plain spoken return to the what they viewed as the original church's mission so going mm -hmm. stripping away all of the um, ostentatious symbols of the catholic church or even the church of england and going to a, a more simple sort of way of worship and church structure so essentially he, he would have thought the puritan reforms didn't go far enough right um, so from the beginning, I guess you would call the Quaker movement an anti-establishment kind yeah, of, of absolutely, movement. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. So he and others that were similarly dissatisfied with the church as it existed in England uh, broke off, and they were one of a ton of different religious sects that emerged in this period. There were several that uh, we don't know about today. I mean, the Grindletonians and the <laughs> Muggletonians and other Harry Potter-esque sounding yeah, I was things, say muggles, that's what <laughs> right? And um, and so a lot of them emerged in the central part of England or the northern part, mm -hmm. and um, they were away from any sort of oversight from the political and religious structure of the time. It was a a really tumultuous political period. They had just survived the English Civil War, killed the king, right, and right. you had a series of different political structures in place. So um, it was a time that allowed for a lot of groups to emerge like the Quakers. Did those early Quakers involve themselves in that political tumult, or did they largely try to stay away from it? Um, it was sort of a mixed bag. Um, those who were involved in the English Civil War typically were on the parliamentarian side, so those against the king. And so they would be what we would see as reformers. Terms like liberal and conservative don't really apply in this context, but um, if you think of those who are for tradition as more conservative, then the Quakers would be on the other side of that. Okay. Um, some actually fought, which I think is surprising to many, because we think of the Quakers as pacifists. They weren't initially, but they were... Um, some were apolitical, but mm. they were, you know, more than anything else, they were somewhat of opportunists. They would go with whatever political side was in favor, trying to win them over, not necessarily um, bending their own views to accommodate that political structure, but they were, they weren't politically motivated necessarily. They were using politics as a means toward a, a, a larger end, I guess, yes. mm -hmm. in that way. All right, so you said, um, I, I want to come back to that whole thread there, but um, something you said caught my attention, that uh, early Quakers weren't necessarily pacifist, even mm -hmm. though when we think, or when I think of um, the Friends, I think of pacifism as right. one of their predominant theological ideas, or, or maybe it's a social idea, I'm not sure. but. Um, um, where did uh, the emphasis on pacifism come from and why wasn't it there uh, early on? I think initially it wasn't there um, 
it's hard to explain the absence of something. It, it just sure. it, something grew. It grew over time, but I think the main reason that it emerged was because they experienced their own persecution. They were um, treated very badly at the hands of local and state government hmm. early on, and were imprisoned often. Felt experienced physical punishment by the Puritans. Or, or whoever, whoever was whoever in power, was in power. yeah. Okay. All right, all right. And actually, the the most extreme cases against the Quakers happened in the American colonies. Um, that's where you have your only instances of actual state executions of of Quakers um, because they disagreed with the Puritans here. But they, over time, I think it was through their experience of persecution which led to their more tolerant attitude and right. a realization that. Um, violence was uh, against their belief system and mission, and so I think that's where the pacifist ideas hmm. come from. So it was born partly from their theological commitments, but even maybe more so from their experience in the social sphere. Absolutely. Yeah. And early on, you even hear use of militant language that they would get from both the Bible and from just the language of the day, and that tends to kind of fall away over time. Okay. We might come back to the history, but um, since we're on the subject of pacifism, uh, today, um, contemporary uh, Quakers, do is this pacifist strain still an active part of the practice of religion, and does it spill over into the political realm in any way? I would say it probably, I mean, there are, there are different threads of Quakerism that still exist today. So you find some that are more, have more emphasis on the Bible, some that are quietist. Um, you'll go to a meeting where there's Explain no... Explain quietism, please. I just... um, quietism, uh, I, I don't know if I can give it the best definition, but it's where there's more of an emphasis on the inner thought process and less of an outward expression um, of the faith. It would be, in this instance, they aren't... Uh, you have meetings that are entirely silent, um, which is not necessarily how quietism is practiced in other faiths, but that's how it usually manifests so in Quakers. The quietist strain would, would tend to discourage Quakers from being active, I guess, outside the, the worship realm, but it might, might discourage political participation. It could. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so I, I'm sorry I interrupted. Oh, no, that's you were, all right. You were talking about how uh, pacifism might... Uh, um, be expressed in today's climate. Sure, in American Quakerism and, and probably British as well, you tend to find more of um, the theology motivating people to behave in a manner that would be reflective of what they call the inner light, and which is, I guess, most analogous to the Holy Spirit, but not necessarily. <laughs> it's a little more complicated than that. And so it motivates people to have their outward behavior reflect what they think their faith is motivating them to do. And so the pacifism, like we said, probably comes from the experience of previous generations having been persecuted. Right. And so you tend to find more of a liberal bent in Quaker communities today, but that's not uh, always the case because there's some that might have a an odd strain that is maybe more evangelical in its appearance. So when you use the term liberal, you're speaking along the political spectrum. Right. So, so you would um, probably not expect to find many Quakers who identify with evangelicalism, although that's a global statement. There might be some. Sure. So uh, it, if we were to, to look at the Quaker community today, we would see them more toward the, the left end of the political spectrum and their support of certain social issues and right. social justice and things like Typically, that. Typically, but then again, you know, there's an exception that will prove the rule. Yeah, we, it, we have a tendency to make broad generalizations, right. so we know that there, there will be exceptions. Um, so you mentioned the uh, theological idea that tends to um, push Quakers, I guess, towards the left a little bit, and that's this idea of the inner light, mm -hmm. uh, which you said was ana analogous in some ways to the idea of the Holy Spirit. So I've always thought of the inner light as um, uh, a kind of divine spark um, inside, and, and Quakers believe that resides in every person. Is that right. correct? Right, that is. So, so the, uh, what do the Quakers do with the idea of um, human nature? Um, traditional Christianity teaches that human nature um, has this kind of evil component to it right. uh, that, that tends to push people toward sinful behavior. 
But that's an idea that's alien to the Quakers, is that correct? I don't know if it's entirely alien, but it would definitely not be emphasized um, mm -hmm. like you would see in some other denominations. So um, the early Quakers definitely emphasized the evil nature of those who disagreed with them, which was the majority of people. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but they, uh, they did believe that everyone was capable of redemption, um, and that occurred through what they would call um, it was convincement rather than a conversion experience. And mm -hmm. so you convince someone of the realization of the inner light being within them. And once that happened, then that was it. You didn't need baptism. In fact, they frowned on baptism because it was made done with water, which was earthly and unnecessary. Right. There was no other sacraments that needed to occur. Mm -hmm. um, it was just merely recognition of the inner light. And that was all that it took. Well, that's it. That, that kind of beginning in an anti-establishment environment still exist then because it, the, what you're describing here is is a way of being religious that seems to be sort of anti the churchly structure and oh, absolutely. structure that we would normally associate with traditional Christianity. Right. From yeah. from the earliest days they um, would be thrown in jail a lot and usually that was for vagrancy or interrupting ministers during their sermons because they would travel to communities other than wherever they were originally from and try to be disruptive, mm -hmm. intentionally trying to what they would perceive as wake the people up to what they saw as truth. Others would perceive it as being a nuisance in their community. Well, to use a, a term that's been used in the political realm a lot, uh, populism, is this a kind of religious populism in a sense? Uh, in a, a religion sense. of the common person? Um, Absolutely. I think one way to think of Quakerism, especially early on, is that it's in some ways the logical conclusion of Protestantism. So you get away from this notion early on that you have a priest or a pope who intercedes for you. And then with Martin Luther and subsequent uh, Protestant thinkers, the idea that anyone has access to um, God in the same way. The Quakers take it even a step further. Like the Bible's important, but it's not necessary. So you don't even have to be able to read the Bible in order to be able to access the inner light. You don't need someone to perform a sacrament for you. You can have your meetings in a field or uh, someone's mm. home. Right. You don't need to have them in a church, which they called steeple houses, which was meant to be <laughs> so somehow that's offensive. That's a derogatory <laughs> term, right? Right. They called priests yeah. hirelings because they were paid for hirelings. their services. Yeah. Uh -huh. Wow. So if, if I were to go to a Quaker meeting today, there wouldn't be an officiant or? or it depends, again. Okay. <laughs> but, sorry. Again, yeah, yes, for the right, right. most so, part, if you go to a, um, a meeting that's uh, generally silent, there might be someone, they're often in people's homes, sometimes meeting houses, like in, um, in Greensboro, you see meeting houses and whatnot, but they're you typically would find that there might be someone who leads the beginning of the quiet time and then ends it, but that person wouldn't have any sort of recognition as clergy or they wouldn't be ordained in any way. Okay. So anti-establishment right right down the line, yeah. populist right down the line. Yeah. Um, let's get back to the idea of the inner light just a, a moment. Um, it seems to me that that theological thought or that doctrine um, hits the road in a, in a funny kind of way in that it, it really highlights respect for human life, I would think. Mm -hmm. if, if you think that there is a, a divine spark in every person, you would tend to have a greater respect, I would think, uh, for human beings. Sure. Does that translate any, any way into um, um, social justice ideas? Because I know Quakers are, you said they were kind of left on the political spectrum, and, and they generally are known, I think, for advocacy uh, for social justice issues. So uh, maybe unpack that connection there just a little bit between sure. the theology and, and the political positions when it comes to to certain positions like social justice. Right. Um, I think that you would find them typically rooting for the underdog, whoever mm -hmm. that may be in any circumstance. So they work with refugees, they go to um, developing countries and try to provide services that are not being provided by political or uh, other organizational structures in the area. Um, there have historically been major advocates for women's rights. Um, mm -hmm. Many early abolitionists were Quakers and oftentimes sort of proto-feminists as well. Right. Um, so they typically are, in terms of social justice, very much advocates for providing services and rights for those who may not be receiving them otherwise. Mm -hmm. Is there evidence that Quakers are, are advocating for uh, issues that are relevant today, like uh, immigration? Uh, where might the typical 
Quaker come down on an issue like immigration? I uh, think that climate? they would be um, very, very much open to Syrian refugees, um, mm -hmm. people in, uh, you know, those who are trying to avoid war or um, any sort of dangerous situation, they would be in favor of providing asylum for. Uh, I think that there would be a lot of sympathy for the immigrant communities that uh, our president-elect is not necessarily uh, advocating asylum for, so Latin Americans and uh, those in other parts of the world that have ep economically depressed opportunities where they're from. I, I think that you would see a lot of Quakers advocating for mm -hmm. those people. So historically, uh, Quakers have been abolitionists. They've been uh, advocates for women's rights. Mm -hmm. Uh, were they on the forefront of civil rights uh, yes. movements mm -hmm. in the 60s? So um, advocates for civil rights for all Americans. Um, um, as you suggested, probably now in this climate, advocate, advocates for immigrant rights. Um, uh, what about LGBT communities? They're very um, open to mm -hmm. um, you know all peoples of every different uh, ethnic minorities of women's rights as well as uh, gender and uh, sexual politics, they're, they're very much open to people of all different backgrounds. I, I can't think of a group that they would be discriminatory towards. And again, that comes back to the, the theological belief in, in the, the inner light. Right. So it sounds like um, so you've got this theological belief that uh, push Quakers uh, to the left politically in terms of their social advocacy and in terms of their positions for social justice. But at the same time, you have this kind of history of quietism, as, as you phrased it, uh, that might discourage um, involvement in the political sphere. Uh, right. Those two things seem to be at odds with one another in a, in a sense. Yeah, I, I think that the Quakers are interesting in large part because when you think you have them figured out, there's another <laughs> layer there. And uh, just taking, for instance, like women's rights, um, Quakers from a very early date allowed for um, female preaching, which many communities did not of the 17th century. In fact, their first preacher is arguably a woman, Elizabeth Hooten. But they had a complicated relationship with how they actually treated women within the movement. So they were treated better than most for the time, but maybe are given a little too much credit at times for how they dealt with issues. And so I think in subsequent generations, they caught up and even became more progressive than most um, of their contemporaries. But it's, it's the sort of thing where, on the one hand, it appears like they should be advocating people to be outside of political um, fray. But then on the other hand, there's a compulsion there to provide for those who need it the most. And right. so they're, they're torn in that well, regard. Well, and in fact, well, I was, I was reading uh, some, some Quaker history, and I found um, one report from a group of North Carolina Quakers at, at their annual meeting um, suggested that any Quaker who was involved in politics should be disowned. I guess that's a, um, a phrase that means excommunication or, or, or cut off from the group. Right. Yet, on the other hand, you have um, throughout history people like William Penn, who was governor of Pennsylvania. Right. Um, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken that Richard Nixon was a Quaker and Herbert Hoover, is that correct? So I, two, I believe so. Two of Nixon's our presidents. The, uh, probably the biggest surprise of right. that group. <laughs> when you talk about pacifism, you don't think of right. Vietnam. And, and again, so um, that, that kind of um, uh, makes your point that we can't put all Quakers in one box sure. and, and easy and, and to be easily understood. Um, so since I brought up uh, William Penn, uh, of course, he was um, famous for um, Pennsylvania. Right. Um, and that became um, an early model of religious liberty mm -hmm. uh, in America long before uh, religious liberty was guaranteed constitutionally. Um, in colonial America, we have this, this shining example of, of a colony that was dedicated to that. Um, and again, you suggest that the emphasis on religious liberty was not so much a kind of uh, theological imperative as much as it was a response to uh, the social situation and the persecution. Right, absolutely. Uh, so. In the earliest years of the Quaker movement, the, no one was advocating for religious toleration. Uh, they're, they're, none of their contemporaries were, and neither were they. They were all fighting for their the truth as they saw it, and to the exclusion of everyone else. Right. And within a couple of generations, and you'd put Penn kind of in the second generation of Quakers, 
that through their experience, as we talked about, really led them to have a more um, open and tolerant approach to their neighbors because they had seen mm -hmm. so many of their own brethren persecuted that they felt that it was necessary to, at the very least, tolerate, if not fully accept, those of different faiths. Right. And so, yeah, uh, Pennsylvania becomes this interesting place that, you know, a generation before, even within the same faith, probably wouldn't have advocated for, but then it becomes very um, open to all, not right. just and even Christians. And it's interesting to me, I mean, I think we tend to equate the idea of religious liberty with enlightenment ideals. Mm -hmm. um, in that they were guaranteed through the Constitution. Uh, but here we have an early example, and I guess we owe a debt to the Quakers, really, um, for um, this ideal and value that we cherish of religious liberty in this country. Uh, they, they were the first to put it into practice uh, in colonial America. Well, I, I mean, yes, they were the biggest example. I think that you have, with Roger Williams. Well, Roger and, Williams, Right, yes, but and, that was a less successful, I guess, example, right. because mm -hmm. it just didn't, um, take off the way Pennsylvania did, and <laughs> it's never quite as populous. Well, uh, since you mentioned tolerance and intolerance in conjunction with Penn, um, I, I'd like to switch topics just a little bit, but I think it's related somewhat. Uh, you, you teach a fascinating course um, on um, witch hunts mm -hmm. and witch trials. Um, and again, like we did with the Quakers, tracing from Europe to America and talking about intolerance, you do much the same with the uh, history of witch hunts and witch trials. Can mm -hmm. you say just a, a little bit about that? Sure. Um, this class is a first year seminar th um, with Watauga Residential College here at App, and um, it was born out of the uh, common reading that all of the freshmen or first year students did um, about, the, on the book, John Ronson's So You've Been Publicly Shamed, talking about internet um, shaming mm -hmm. practices of the last decade or so. and. My background in early modern religious history, I saw a direct connection there with the witch hunts of the uh, 16th and 17th centuries. So what we do in this class is we looked at the origins of what caused this spike in witch hunts that occurred mm -hmm. from about 1560 to 1640. And it had to do with a lot of political and religious change of the period. Um, it was at, right after the reformations and you have uh, the discovery of the new world and all people's lives were kind of shaken up and so they started to look to their neighbors and accuse them of things that in previous generations right. they wouldn't have done. And so we look at that and then we look at the case study of Salem which happened much later than the European hunts and the they were pretty much done by the middle of the 17th century in Europe and then about 50 years later you have this case in Puritan New England and so we kind of look at okay so what's going on here and why did they do that and then we looked at more modern shaming um, from the book mm -hmm. uh, that I mentioned and uh, we talk about how people today attack one another but there's an anonymity involved in how right. it happens on the internet and uh, there aren't thankfully burnings typically right. <laughs> but there are, people's lives can be destroyed by the way they deal with one another um, when they find that their fellow internet users haven't behaved the way that they like. So the pattern you've uncovered here in this class is that uh, periods of religious and political turmoil, mm -hmm. change and transition often foment this kind of uh, reactionary scapegoating, if you will. Sure. So in, in Europe, it was witches. In the, in the colonies, it was witches. So um, at least, I mean, the internet gives us kind of an easy way to do this, but uh, what I'm hearing you say is that a lot of the kind of public shaming that goes on can be traced back to uh, in our own society, religious and political upheaval, in a sense. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and fear. Fear, fear absolutely. Yeah. Fear of social change, political, religious change, anything the unknown uh, gives cause to people um, lashing out at one another, which right. is probably one of the sad truths of humanity, but hopefully isn't always the case. Is there a way out? I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> what brought about eventually into uh, witch hunts in Europe and America? And yeah, it, a couple of different things. So in Europe, a lot of scientific ideas helped in the uh, belief in supernatural things occurring. People started to be skeptical of previous explanations, and so they started to think, well, maybe this elderly woman isn't in fact a witch, but she is mentally ill or, you know, dementia or something would be an explanation. And so that would be something that needed to be treated or rather mm -hmm. than persecuted. Um, 
in the American colonies, it seems to have been when the accusations started going up the political ladder, when oh. the <laughs> wife of the governor was accused, then it was that was the end of that. <laughs> People got serious about putting it into that's it. That's right. That's yeah. right. I don't know what it'll be here. I mean, I am concerned about the current state of affairs, you know. Our president-elect likes to tweet a lot and say things that are sometimes inflammatory, and I don't know if that will encourage a culture mm. of um, negative rants, or if it'll mm. in some ways be, um, maybe people will get to a, a point of saturation with it, and that'll sure. lead to it stopping too. Well, in any event, it seems like um, a really clever way to get your students involved in um, a way of looking at history, religious and political history, uh, and bringing it into the contemporary world. And that's what we like to do with this program. So I thank you for coming oh, you. and uh, showing us how uh, Quaker ideals uh, in history affect a certain political process today. And uh, it's been very interesting. Hey, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you for tuning in to Religion and Life for this week. And make sure to come back and join us next time as we discuss religion and violence and ISIS. Once again, I'm Ozzy Oswalt, and I will see you next time.